everybody, it's Allie, and welcome to our YNR chat for Sunday, February 4th, 2018. We have some breaking news. As of just a couple of days ago, Melissa Claire Egan, Chelsea, is leaving YNR. Did anybody see this coming? Because I didn't see this coming. I'm in complete and total shock over this. She issued a statement over her social media saying, quote, after much thought and six wonderful years, I have decided to leave YNR. I love this show and this genre so very much and am so grateful to this amazing crew and cast, especially my beyond wonderful Josh Morrow, Nick. This cast, crew, and everyone behind the scenes at Sony and CBS are truly the best at what they do and are my family. To you incredible fans, thank you for everything. This isn't goodbye, truly, just goodbye for now. All my love, Melissa. Wow! Wow, wow, wow. I, I, it sounds like this is her decision entirely. She says, I've decided to leave YNR. I don't know how to feel about this. I mean, my initial reaction is, of course, sad. She's Chelsea. She's become a staple of the show. Is this news to you guys? How are you feeling about it? How, how are you dealing with this news? Uh, I want to, I want to toss that out as our poll question for the week. How do you feel about uh, Melissa Claire Le Egan deciding to leave YNR? Are you okay with it? I mean, are, are you disappointed? Are, are you on a, are you in a state of shock and no? <laughs> Go to yrchat.com. I would love to get your votes and see your comments coming in on this breaking news. Uh, I mean, we have no word as far as I know at this time on when her final air date is going to be or how they're going to write her out of the show. I'm left wondering what the real story is here. Is there something more that she's not saying? Was there something going on behind the scenes? Do, was she not happy? I mean, is, is, is it possible that she was just not feeling the direction of the character and maybe wanting to branch out and do something more creative? Uh, I mean, are there any YNR chatters out there who have the, 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 the truth of the behind the scenes knowledge? Message me or leave a comment or something. I, I would love to know, you know, what the, what the real inner workings of this decision were. Um, I, I, it may very well just be that she uh, came into a, an agreement with YNR. Maybe YNR is... Um, wanting to cycle characters in and out so that the fans can stay fresh, stay connected with them, and so that the characters and the actors and the fans don't feel stale around somebody. Um, I, I, I honestly am just not sure. I, I feel sad about it, personally, uh, but it is similar to the way I feel about Dina leaving the show. I have a strong feeling that she'll be back. It doesn't, it doesn't, I, I, I just would imagine that she is someone who would be open to taking the role back again in, in the future, or who knows, maybe they're going to consider recasting her. I don't know anything more than, than what she's posted on her social media at this point, so... I'll just do my best to provide you more on this story as it develops. <laughs> it's, 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 um, it's funny because I was not a Chelsea fan at first. When she came onto the show as this con artist and I didn't trust her at that point and then became involved with Adam, I really didn't like the story of, of Chelsea and Adam when this character first started moving in that direction. I was and am a big Sharon and Adam fan. I really enjoyed the Sharon and Adam romance and I always felt like Chelsea was butting in on that. <laughs> so I held a chip on my shoulder against Chelsea for a long time. And I recently, probably within the last maybe three years, started warming up to her a lot more and adapting to the charm and what the actress brought to the show. It's also kind of funny 
that I was thinking just this week as Chelsea has a follow-up conversation to the one she had with Sharon last week about Adam, where Chelsea's kind of trying to cover her tracks a little bit, about maybe backtrack a little on some of the things she said about Adam versus Nick. And I thought to myself, well, wouldn't it be interesting, since we've been speculating that Adam might be coming back onto the show, wouldn't it be interesting if Adam came back and he he wasn't there for Chelsea. Wouldn't it be interesting if Adam returned, but it was for Sharon? People don't change. They are who they are and they stay that way. The only thing that changes is their ability to hide it, sometimes even from themselves. Who said it? <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people picked up on that specific quote this week. It was uttered by the queen of cons turned good girl next door, Chelsea. Uh, she is having a little conversation at the coffee house with Hillary this week where Hillary is insisting that she is a good girl now. And Chelsea lets slip that line, that little perhaps projection. <laughs> You know, she lets her guard down enough, and we see as the audience that she doesn't believe that people can really change, probably because she feels she hasn't changed. Chelsea is still a bad girl at heart, and yet she's involved in this relationship with a Boy Scout. <laughs> I think maybe we're seeing Chelsea realizing that inner conflict there. It's... <laughs> Disappointing a little bit that uh, Chelsea is realizing that Nick is a Boy Scout and maybe not being all that into it, while I'm realizing at the same time that Nick is a little bit of a Boy Scout and I think I'm falling in love with him a little bit more every episode. I think that Nick is at his peak adorableness right now, just as Chelsea's realizing maybe she's not that into him. He is so cute in this whole remodeling pro pro project that he has going on. He puts himself on a little tank top, <laughs> you know, because it's going to be a sweaty hot project, puts himself on a tank top, is listening to some country music in the background, he's painting the bathroom, he is just looking adorable. He happens to open up a vent in the wall and looks in to find stacks and stacks of cash. Cash! hidden in the walls of Chelsea's condo to the tune of half a million dollars. Not a small chunk of change. This is not finding a fiver in your coat pocket. This is half a million dollars. And immediately, Nick assumes that this must be Adam's money. This was Adam's house. And furthermore, only someone who's a little bit shady would need to have bundles of $100 bills stashed away in the walls like that. Nick finds it, shows it to Chelsea, insists that they take it to the police. Again, Mr. Boy Scout, we gotta take this to the police just to make sure that it's clean. And it is. The money's clean. The police say that Chelsea can just keep it, which is good. <laughs> it's a good thing that the money's clean. Nobody can trace it because it's not Adam's money at all. It's Chelsea's money. You could tell instantly from the look on Chelsea's face when she realized that Nick found that stash, that it was hers, that she knew about it, that everything that was gonna follow was her pretending to just play dumb. Never seen it, oh, never knew anything about that money. And we even see a couple of scenes later, Chelsea taking a few bundles of that money and stashing it away in an urn vault that has Adam Newman's name on it. Wow, wow, what was that all about? Opening up, it was shocking to see her opening up an, a vault uh, that was is presumably for the ashes of, of Adam Newman. It's empty and she's shoving bundles of cash into that. I, 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 I don't, I don't know what to make of it. I guess that dirty money just doesn't feel right to keep in the bank. <laughs> Oh, and so it's, it's a, a, again, another thing. I'm finding myself so disappointed that the actress is leaving just as I'm, I'm really getting into her doing something different, doing something new, doing something shady. All of this is happening. This money is being unearthed right as 
the news of an internet scam is uh, hitting Fenmore's. Fenmore's has learned that there is a mirror site, a, a mirror website that has been built to look like it's the Chelsea 2.0 portion of the Fenmore's, uh, presumably Fenmore's.com. <laughs> of their website so that when customers are searching for Chelsea 2.0 products, they're finding this fake site where they're ordering dresses and getting the product, but I guess just kind of cutting out Fenmore. So the customers are still, they're not really being ripped off. It's just that Fenmore's is not getting their cut. And I think we can all guess where this money is going. I mean, it's, it, it, it happens to only be affecting Chelsea 2.0 customers. Hmm. <laughs> Of course, Chelsea's now having to pretend she doesn't know anything about it and that she's working with Lauren and specifically Phyllis to find out who could be running this scam that affects her and her brand and her line. And it it's, was a little delicious to watch her pretend to be so shocked about all of this when we know that she's not. Uh, she is now forced into the position of ex being expected to help find the perpetrator, which is most certainly her, or at the very least, someone that we know, possibly even someone that we all know. Phyllis is on this though. She's taking it very personally. She wants to find out who's stealing from Fenmore's. She happens to bump into JT at the coffee house and JT's sitting there bemoaning his horrible life. The fact that his sexy girlfriend is not available to him for sex 24 seven. The fact that his friend has offered him a job that gives him a healthy paycheck every week when he has to do very little. Oh, JT, your life is so bad. And uh, Phyllis wants to make it better, right? She's kind of babying him a little bit. It was, it was, she, and she decides that she has a project. It just so happens that she has a crime that could be investigated forensically by someone like JT. So Phyllis offers him a job doing this on the side. It's something with a little bit of intrigue, something to allow him to get excited about. So she brings JT in on the project. I knew, knew earlier in the week when JT was sitting there having a conversation with Nick that he was going to be up in whatever Chelsea's business was going to be because JT and Nick should have a little bit of animosity between them, right? JT's mo he, he had some issues with Victoria and now he's moving right on back in with Nick's sister and Nick was not happy with him at first, but the way they sat down and hashed it out <laughs> was just fertile ground for a feud that will, I assume, probably take root and grow in the future. So they're making nicey nice. And so I'm thinking that J JT immediately is going to be involved in busting Chelsea, busting up Nick's world. Nick was just way too accepting of that relationship with Victoria. Um, I am also wondering if JT <laughs> is now the replacement hacker for Ravi. I mean, Kevin, it's, it's kind of funny, isn't it, that JT's all of a sudden taking on this job where he's a reverse hacker, I guess, just as we've said goodbye to Ravi, we've said goodbye to Kevin. It almost seems like JT's now uh, sitting there in that spot. I'm sure that he's going to do an excellent job of, of finding Chelsea out. He's already on to her. He traced the fake website back to an owner and then traced that owner to a bank account in a, that's in the same name uh, as the website and that we have seen Chelsea holding a fake ID for. So we know that Chelsea is fully behind this scheme and that JT is really, really close to busting her. She went to the bank, actually, dressed in this retro wig hat combo to close out the account to get the cash and JT was maybe an inch from catching her right before she closed out the account. 
I don't understand what Chelsea's motivation is here. I think that's the piece of meat that we can all kind of chew on and speculate about, and that's maybe the fun part of this story, because it doesn't make sense that Chelsea would need the money. Why would she possibly need the money? She surely was left millions of dollars when Adam died, right? And then plus she's got her own money. She's a famous fashion designer. So at first I thought, well, maybe it's, is it the thrill of the con? Is Chelsea just getting bored with her life? And so she wanted to do something that would keep things interesting, maybe add a little element of danger? Or are we going to be surprised to find out that Chelsea is siphoning cash away from Chelsea 2.0 to help someone who wants or needs to stay hidden? After all of the headbutting that has gone on between JT and Reed, it was incredible to see them stumble into this bonding session. We'll make that a jam session. <laughs> I, I just, I thought it was wonderful. I really enjoyed JT and Reed this week, and it kind of made me look at JT in a different way. While JT was at the coffee house, he, we see him wandering around the booths, the seat, the wooden seating booths, and he finds a spot on one of the booths where years and years ago, his wild rebel teenage self carved his name and Colleen's within a heart, you know, and I just thought that was such a nice touch. It, it, it drew me into JT and his story this week. He seemed very self-reflective in that moment, as if he was thinking back on his life, maybe even still longing for his true love, perhaps longing for his youth and the days when things were less heavy, less complicated. And, and we still don't know why he's using these pills. He may very well be using these pills as an escape from from the heaviness and the complications of his life. Or maybe he's like dying, I don't know. Even if he is dying and the pills he was taking were for a legitimate heart condition, he still shouldn't be washing them down with wine. So there's still something gritty going on there. But I loved the moment when he pulled out his old guitar and he starts strumming it, trying to see if he's still got it. And Reed walks in and they begin to talk about music. This is something that they haven't talked about before. This is something that Reed didn't even know about his father. He didn't even know how similar they are. And the way that JT explained to Reed all about how he thought he was going to be the next big thing, you know? I mean, he had the same dreams as Reed had. It honestly almost made me cry. I don't know why it touched me so deeply, but it, it did. I, I, I wonder if maybe it was just the idea that we see a younger version of ourselves and our children and that touched home a little bit for me. Or maybe it was just the notion that as we grow older and we get caught up in the day-to-day -day grind, we forget to dream a little bit. And maybe this is why JT has come off as childish and juvenile to me. Maybe over time he just simply lost touch with his dreams. And who knows, maybe he'll find a way to get back in touch with that and pull Victoria along with him. Ashley manages to negotiate with Victor to get herself a board seat at Newman Enterprises, plenty of funding for whatever she needs to do, and the chief innovation officer title. Woohoo! <laughs> it sounds kind of like a BS title, doesn't it? Chief innovation officer. Okay, okay. But most importantly, wow, Victor agreed to give Ashley oversight of Brash and Sassy, Victoria's division. And Ashley's going to be reporting to Victor directly. So she's not exactly number three at Newman, but she's still number two at very best. I don't know how reporting to Victor 
is any better than reporting to Jack at Jabot. Although she did make a really good point to Jack this week that even though Victor knew all about her paternity and the truth of that all these years, Victor never once threw it in her face. He never once used it as a bargaining chip. So I think maybe that speaks a little bit more to Ashley's preference to go to Newman Enterprises. I just feel bad for Victoria. Victoria returns to Newman Enterprises from a day trip. She was gone for like one day only to find Ashley sitting in her chair. It's nice to see someone challenging Victoria, I guess, but I felt bad for her standing there in her big pink bow tie blouse looking all salty. Victoria immediately, immediately <laughs> schedules a phone call to, to, to get to Victor's office. She confronts Victor immediately. And Victor had, has this oddly calm demeanor right now. Has anybody else noticed that? Victor seems like a man who's enjoying the back burner in a way. Like he's happy to not be up in the full mix. He just wants to sit back and watch things play. He just wants to sit back and manage. He does placate. Victoria and tells her she's being groomed to take over Newman Enterprises one day, the full company. So she needs to learn to delegate certain responsibilities such as brash and sassy. And Ashley, having all her experience at Jabot, is the perfect person to oversee brash and sassy, regardless of the fact that that, that part of the company is Victoria's baby. It did make sense from a business perspective, but Ashley is sitting behind Victoria's desk building up an army against Victoria. That army includes Lily and Abby. And I, I don't understand entirely why Ashley is being so passive aggressive toward Victoria. To, to, to what gain? is it for Ashley? Even if Ashley were able to squeeze Victoria out of the company altogether, she's still aiming at this glass ceiling that has Victor Newman above it. You know, she will never be at the top of Newman Enterprises. I, I'm, com I'm puzzled. I, I, I'm not loving this decision from Ashley. We'll just say that. Victoria decides to visit Abby in Paris to check in and get rid of, get get out of the way of the wicked witch. She told Victoria that that or sorry, she, Victoria told JT that that was an inside joke. I kind of think that maybe Victoria used to call Ashley the wicked witch when Ashley was with Victor and and Ashley was Victoria's stepmother all of those years ago. I would think that, I don't know, I just would have think that some of that would have been water into the bridge by now. I don't get why Ashley's preparing for war. And furthermore, I don't get why Victoria isn't in response to that preparing for the fight. It seems unlike Victoria to just let someone else sit behind her desk, do what used to be her job, and allow herself to get run out of town. Nikki! <laughs> <laughs> you naughty, naughty girl! Nikki basically serves Victor up on a silver platter to Ashley so that she can go get some fresh meat. <laughs> Nikki said, here, Ashley, you can have the steak. I'll be having the veal. <laughs> holy crap, holy cow, holy cow! Nikki, first of all, actually calls a private lunch meeting with Ashley to encourage her to get close to Victor. Nikki says, Ashley, you're going to be working with Victor real close. And if I know my husband, I'm pretty sure he's going to start developing feelings for you. And I just want you to know that if you start developing feelings for him, then that's totally okay. At first I thought, is this some kind of weird reverse psychology? <laughs> but now I don't think so. The writing almost seems to be on the wall that Ashley and Victor are going to 
end up falling in love? I don't want that. Please tell me that Victor and Ashley are not going to end up in a relationship. It almost seems like the way Ashley reacted to Nikki's suggestion was like, um, no thank you. I don't want Victor. That almost makes me think that she's going to end up wanting Victor. And I don't want to see that. I have a feeling also that Eileen Davidson does not want to see that. Eric Braden <laughs> implied just a little bit in his book that maybe Eileen Davidson doesn't care for him that much, or that's the impression that I got, at least that they're not close off screen. <laughs> that maybe these two personalities aren't exactly meshable. So uh, I don't know, I, 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 I don't know. I just, I don't wanna see it. I don't wanna see it. Do you guys wanna see that? Ugh. <laughs> Ashley deserves more and different than Victor. And I don't know, maybe so does Nikki on Friday. Good Lord. <laughs> Nikki, well, first of all, we get the introduction of our sexy new building contractor, Arturo. And uh, I, we were all speculating on who the woman would be who he would woo and who would woo him. And I don't think any of us saw it coming that that would be Nikki. She saw Nick struggling to negotiate with this guy. She stops Nick from a near disaster when he's trying to negotiate lowball and negotiate the, the price of the building repairs on these housing units that they've purchased that I'm sure Tessa will be living in soon. And Nikki manages to cut a deal directly with Arturo and then she <laughs> books a room upstairs so that he can fix her plumbing <laughs> so that he can rewire her electricity <laughs> so, that, so that he can hammer her nails oh my goodness oh my goodness wow 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 and for someone who is trying real hard to keep up appearances for the Newman family, Nikki was not too discreet about it either. She walks hand in hand up the athletic club stairs with Arturo to where the hotel suites are and Phyllis sees the whole thing. I mean, they're practically cackling and grabbing each other's butts and, and, and Phyllis is like, huh? <sighs> Call me flummoxed. I'm sure that Phyllis is going to run and tell Nick about this whole thing, right? And then I'm sure somebody's going to tell Victor. I, honest to goodness, don't even think, though, that Nikki is doing this in any way, shape, or form to try to make Victor jealous. I think Nikki is just enjoying herself. I think she's just trying to take a page from the book of Ashley and is liberating herself sexually with a younger man. Who knows, maybe with, maybe Phyllis was just sitting there simply taking notes uh, for the next person who she would like to set Ravi up on a blind date with. Ooh, Lily made an excuse to get out of the house saying that she was at a business meeting with Victoria, but then Kane accidentally found out that Victoria was out of town. Busted! How about that? Lily caught in a lie, not the other way around for once. It's not a good foot to start out this re-relationship on. I was glad that Kane didn't immediately confront her about the whole thing because I'm still okay giving Lily leeway here. I think that Lily needs to go through her process here of accepting what her new life looks like. And I think Kane played it well. I think when he did confront her, he seemed very warm. He seemed very understanding. It was weird that he was watching her on the creepy nanny cam, <laughs> seeing that maybe she's not comfortable as comfortable with Sam as she's trying to say that she is. He sees her on the creepy nanny cam and he talks to her. He, he does a really good job, I think, of just opening up the space for a conversation. And I liked when he said, hey, it is really important for us to blend Sam into our family, but our family starts with you and me. We're the foundation here. So we need to make sure that you and me are okay. And a great way to do that is just to have a date. I loved 
seeing Kane and Lily out on their movie date. It was cute seeing them making out. The people behind them were practically rolling their eyes. <laughs> and then Lily gets startled by some gunfire that happens on screen and she ends up dumping her bucket of popcorn all over the poor unsuspecting single woman who was sitting in the front row. Like, I just felt sorry for that woman. She's sitting there at a movie by herself while there's annoying people making out behind her and then another couple behind her maybe she's feeling all lonely or something and then like that's the great end to my day I got popcorn dumped on my head I don't know <laughs> I was identifying more with the poor woman in the front row. Another role that I think I could have embraced YNR, thanks. <laughs> um Lily and Kane ultimately decide maybe it's a little safer for the public if we just watch our movie at home. So they sat there on the couch watching an old black and white, which is kind of their thing. Does anybody know the significance of the movie that they were watching? It seems like YNR has folded in more uh, probably CBS properties, probably things that Sony owns into the show recently. So I wonder if there if does anybody know what the movie was? that they were watching at home. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure who it was, uh, but I'm not as big on, I'm not as familiar with classic movies anyway. But it was just nice to see them taking time to be a couple. I think these are the little details that when raising a child get really easy to lose. So seeing all of the romance this week was really wonderful for me. I think that it's a, it's a new beginning for Lillian Kane. I think that a vow renewal seems very right. Kane suggests that they just get married again they just renew their vows with one another and I think it's it's good for the audience to try to fall in love with Lily and Kane all over again I think we need to remember why we wanted them together in the first place and Kane was really pulling out all the stops this week to make it a romantic week for her you know, it, it was borderline overkill for crying out loud she woke she wakes up in the morning and he's got breakfast waiting for her and he's dressed as a waiter and it was very cute and then later he has set up a sexy massage for her I thought it was great I it's funny because I <laughs> <laughs> I was watching the breakfast scene and I don't even know why I zeroed in on this but I was looking at Kane holding Lily's hands and I was looking at his hands and I was noting how very soft they seem. Kane just seems to have very very soft hands and then when he came to give her the massage and I was just noticing again those soft hands. <laughs> I had a legit 60 second blackout just, just like not where I stopped YNR. I stopped watching YNR. It was still on the screen, but I had a legitimate 60 second blackout just thinking about how soft Kane's hands are. Hillary is still shopping baby daddies and wasn't it interesting to note that Billy took a look at Hillary's shopping list and noted that he happens to have all of the qualities she's looking for like smart good looking I mean, he's got it all and after Hillary leaves there's this little moment between Billy and Phyllis where they realized that they've never even broached the topic of having children together. And they it takes them both back a little bit. I mean, they're looking at each other going, oh, wait, did you want kids? No. Oh, did you? No. No, definitely we don't want kids. Which to me says that Billy and Phyllis are going to end up catching baby fever and they'll probably have one by the end of the year. Hey, if you if you looked at my 2018 predictions for YNR, I predicted that we were going to have, I don't remember, I think I said four new babies born this year. I mean, I think it's got to happen. Somebody's got to start having some babies or our cast is going to shrivel away to nothingness for future generations. So I have a, I just had a feeling that this year YNR was going to try to build up some more generations. We haven't really had any new legacy characters born onto the show in a while. So I wouldn't be surprised if Billy and Phyllis uh, were, decided to have a baby as well. 
Hillary, in addition to sperm shopping, <laughs> has been shopping for investors for GC Buzz, her company. And although Devon isn't the highest bidder, he does offer Hillary two key things. First of all, he can keep her staff in place. None of the other investors are guaranteeing that Mariah and everybody else is not going to get fired. And Mariah specifically is not happy about the idea that she might lose her job. And second, Devon offers Hillary an understanding of, you know, what her personal goals and what her professional goals are. And he offers her being able, you know, the opportunity to be able to facilitate those goals within this new merger arrangement. I have a feeling, as I'm sure all of you do, that Devon and Hillary are going to find that their individual personal and professional goals will align <laughs> probably sooner rather than later. Hillary... Uh, confessed to Devon on Friday that she is finding the in vitro process to be more sterile and more impersonal than she imagined. Like creating this beautiful little life while lying on a cold, unloving table in a doctor's office. I I think that, and, and all, all that, I really liked that Hillary mentioned that the notion of being implanted with a stranger's sperm didn't quite feel right to her. I think that Hillary is probably going to realize that this is not really what she wants for herself. I honestly can see Hillary and Devon coming to a very modern, very professional agreement to just have a baby together. Hillary has made very well known what it is that she wants, and Devon is probably, he, I think he's said in the past while they were married that he wanted children. He's surely going to be wanting to have an heir one of these days, and let's face it, these two would make beautiful babies together, so can't you just see them coming up with some kind of a professional contract or something to have a baby together and then maybe as they near the due date they end up tearing it up as they realize that they are still in love and then that they want a life together too. Noah packs up all of Tessa's belongings and dumps them off in one big box for her at Devon's office while he's there taking the opportunity to enlighten Devon all about what was going on between Mariah and Tessa when they were on their double date trip. Noah, first of all, doesn't seem to want to hear or buy that it was one kiss and one moment. I think in some way Noah imagines that it was this ongoing affair and he presents it to Devon as such. Even so, I, I, I think that Devon was just infinitely more understanding than Noah was, even upon first finding out about this and not having any further information. Devon <laughs> bumps into Mariah at the coffee house and gives her, offers her a chance to explain and to apologize for what she was doing and feeling behind his back and for not confiding in him about it. I think that Devon treated Mariah really well. I was impressed with how intently he just listened to her. He didn't come in with some big speech. He just said, let's talk, let's, let's sit down and I'm gonna listen. And, and, and the feedback that he provided was minimal. I really liked and respected the way that Devon handled all of that, just giving her space to talk about it. And I think in some ways Devon has treated Mariah a little bit more like a loved one than even Noah did at first. And Devon has become, as the week progressed, the driving force between t uh, behind Tessa's redemption story, which is, I think, what YNR is trying to give us. Devon doesn't realize that Tessa is now homeless since she's been kicked out of the apartment with Noah. She's secretly sleeping on his office couch, rolling out the old sleeping bag. We have to remember that this is a girl who used to sleep in her car. So this is Tessa going back to square one 
And little by little, I do think that she wants to try to regain some semblance of her old life, even if she doesn't know exactly what form that's going to take. Early in the week, we had this really confusing interaction between Mariah and Tessa, where they bump into each other, and Tessa says to Mariah, well, I hope you're happy. Hope you got what you wanted. And Mariah is stunned, I think, by this line of conversation saying uh, uh, like what it was it was like a touch hostile toward Mariah when it was Tessa who is the one who brought all of this on herself by stealing Mariah's journal and Mariah just is taken aback and just responds happy you think you think that I got what I wanted this is not even close to what I wanted and then when Tessa realizes the tone has changed, she changes her tone and says, well, then maybe it's not too late for us. Well, I mean, talk about emotional whiplash. Which is it? Are you hostile toward Mariah or are you wanting to be with Mariah? I, I, I feel bad for Mariah because of these mixed signals. I mean, Tessa spent all this time telling Mariah no, 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 and then, and then, uh, you know, and then uh, uh, kind of being, and then stealing from her, and then being victimy about that, and now you want to be with her? I just, it, it doesn't confuses me. I feel bad for Mariah, and I don't think that Mariah really needs to get pulled into this mess. The fact that they have to work together now is hard. It's going to be a double-edged sword. Devon, buys GC Buzz from Hillary, and that means that his sidekick, Tessa, is gonna have to work and spend time with Hillary's sidekick, Mariah. I'm assuming this is a sign that YNR is not just gonna flush the storyline away, that we are at the precipice of Tessa's redemption story, possibly even of Mariah and Tessa rebuilding their relationship. I'm a little curious to know where Noah fits into this. Tessa was all about her love for Noah, and now she really isn't approaching him to get back together. She seems to be approaching Mariah to get together, and Noah's just left out in the cold. He was having a conversation with Nick this week talking about him and his life, being that he's at kind of a crossroads here. He's trying to reimagine his dreams. He's trying to find his passions. And I, I just want to forget about Tessa and Mariah for a moment and think about the, the, the fact that Noah's still a player in this too. I really liked that YNR took the time to show us the relationship that really needed to be repaired, and that was Noah and Mariah. I liked seeing Noah and Mariah as brother and sister just go into the movies, just deciding to put it behind them for even just a moment, go sit at the movies, go be chill again, just talk about something that's not Tessa, and I, I thought it was a good starting point for them, and I liked the sense in the air that, you know what, we can't change what happened, but we are family, and that has to count for something. Noah has the luxury of being able to distance himself from Tessa to heal from what happened, while apparently Mariah can't do that since she's working for Hillary. And Devon pretty much forces the girls into situations, it seems. Uh, and, and he did kind of like lock them in a room together and force them to talk it out. Like rather than letting it continue to be awkward in his workplace, he just wants these two to find a way to get past it. Although I don't know, did anybody else get the impression that maybe Devon is really rooting for them to be together. He surely saw the way Tessa's eyes lit up when she was talking about Mariah and the kiss and trying to explain what happened from her perspective. And Devon knows Mariah intimately. This is his friend and he knows that Mariah has been so affected deeply by all of this. So maybe uh, he, he's pushing them together a little bit. I don't know. They do end up just deciding to pick a point and start hashing it out. So Tessa starts by giving what seemed like a heartfelt apology, but I'm still struggling to trust 
Tessa, she keeps insisting about how much she cares about Mariah and yet the act of stealing Mariah's journal just seems so disrespectful not only to the friendship but to Mariah as a person and every time Mariah refers to the stolen song, Tessa is now referring to it as our song and that seems so manipulative to me. Mariah had no willing part in the development of this song, so it just seems like a way to sugarcoat this really crappy thing that Tessa did to her, like trying to mask it as some grand romantic collaborative effort when it was actually something really wrong, you know? By the way, you just know that that song is going to be playing in the background when Mariah and Tessa finally kiss again and get back together, which is probably not even that far off. Mariah finds where Tessa has her clothes stashed in Devon's office and asks Tessa where she's staying. Tessa lies, says she's renting a room somewhere, and can't you just see it coming? I mean, Mariah has a good heart. She doesn't want to see somebody who she does still care about suffer, so I'm imagining that Mariah's gonna invite Tessa to stay at Sharon's homeless hotel, <laughs> aka Sharon's house, um, and I don't know. I'm assuming they're gonna work on repairing their friendship, if not uh, try to work on developing an actual relationship. Tessa did suggest that they try having a completely fresh start right down to the introduction, just holds out her hand and says, hi, I'm Tessa. But if only it were that easy. It's not that easy. You, you can't just wipe away everything that happened. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm viewing it differently than you. I'm, I, are we are, are we rooting for Tessa and Mariah to patch things up, like take the romantic part off the table. Are, are we rooting for them to 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 heal here? I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe and then and then furthermore, I guess the romantic part. It's not entirely unusual for us to see a romance that has developed out of forgiveness. I mean, every single character on the show has lied to their significant other and has been forgiven, but it is a little bit more rare to see um, like one of the people in the relationship that has done something directly to the other one and then received forgiveness like can I, I just like Tessa straight up stole from Mariah and violated her privacy <laughs> so how is Mariah supposed to, you know it's, it seems more rare that that the that Mariah would turn around and then fully embrace Tessa you know like I don't know can you name any other instances on YNR from the past where someone has straight up screwed over the other one and still we still wanted them to get back together I mean Kane did gaslight Lily. He did make her think that he was dead and that she was seeing his ghost. That was pretty terrible. And yet, those hands. Daddy who? <laughs> that was a tough, tough quote from last week. But I, hey, six of you guessed that it was Kane who said that quote last week. He was getting ready to leave Lily on a babysitting duty and he was telling her she was going to be so good at babysitting Sam. They were just going to become absolutely so inseparable that Sam would be saying, Daddy who? <laughs> Congratulations to Henry, Tanya, Ambreen, T. Nicole, Jamie, and Leslie. I do think that was a pretty hard one and you guys got it right. So there's a, a big props going out to you. And I have a new quote for you this week. Here it is. Money always irons out the rough spots. 
I like quotes like that. I don't know, that just, just seems like a weird sort of, I don't know, tidbit about life. Money always irons out the rough spots. Who said it? If you think you know, then you go to yrchat.com and leave me your guess. And if you get it right, then I will give you your shout out on next week's YNR Chat. Okay, it's comment time. Uh, the best part of my week. I keep thinking back to a voicemail that Gary left me. Um, this was probably at the beginning of, of last week. But Gary had commented in regard to Tessa's character that there really is no place to go but up when it comes to a character like this. I would argue that there are two places to go. Uh, when you've hit the bottom at a, at a, as a soap opera character, you can either go up or you can go out. And it seems like YNR is not going to send Tessa out. It seems like they are trying to send her up. I mean, when you've got someone who you know is now homeless, I mean, you can't help but root for the underdog character. So I would say it's, it's probably a slam dunk, uh, foregone conclusion that YNR is now at least going to try to build Tessa back up and maybe gain her uh, uh, some some fans. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I what I really wanted to talk about was Gary's voicemail uh, mentioning a little bit about Chelsea and her character. Gary says, Chelsea has seemed stuck. Maybe because she doesn't have anything to do except react to Nick or be playful with Nick, but she really needs Adam to sparkle. By the way, Gary says Jordan is coming back for an episode. Now, I don't think, Gary, at the point you left this voicemail that you would have known about uh, Chelsea leaving the show in any way. So that's an interesting thing to note and a timely thing to note right now that fans are starting to notice that Chelsea's character seems stuck. So I wonder if that means that the actress was starting to feel stuck. I mean, I don't know anything about that, but it, it just seems so shocking to me that she would leave because I really thought that Melissa Claire Egan was a soap opera lifer. Like I really felt like since she came from All My Children, she just seemed like someone who was gonna go down with the ship, you know? And I, that's why I think it's just extra shocking that she's going to be leaving the show. I didn't know that Jordan's gonna be coming back for, I don't know, you said N episodes. I don't know if that's one episode or not, but uh, maybe there's gonna be some kind of connection in with that fake ID or yada yada. Uh, I, I liked I liked Chelsea as the con, but I also like that you say that she kind of needs Adam to sparkle. And if there is no Adam, then something, you know, she needs a little something. Chelsea really had become the good girl. She was just your like good girlfriend, you know, and there was not really any dimension there. And there's no way that the actress didn't pick up on that if, you know, the fans like you and I were kind of picking up on that too. I don't no, it didn't. It didn't. It didn't bother me seeing Chelsea as as the good girl as much. But it it is interesting that she was really there more to service the character of Nick within the last couple months. And and but but why then are we building her up right at the point where she's going to leave? Is there any chance that this whole con artist thing, this whole money thing, was coming back as a way? for Mal to placate Chelsea, the, the actress, like to give her something, to throw her a bone. That, seems, that sounds so mean, but like, had she complained? I, you don't know, maybe we love just to gossip, but had she complained about not really having anything interesting to do? And maybe this was something that was serviced to her? Was it not enough? I don't know. Please, there's gotta be somebody who listens to, to YNR Chat that knows something more behind the scenes about what went into this decision. Maybe it's something simple, but I wanna know. Somebody. Somebody send me a message and tell me. Uh, Sandra at YRChat.com says, I've never been a fan of Chelsea, but I am into this storyline of the hidden cash and Chelsea's seemingly shady dealings with Chelsea 2.0 web orders for Fenmore's. This is clever. I'm not quite sure yet, but hiding the money in Adam's mausoleum instead of putting it in the bank leads me to believe Chelsea has something major in the works. She's not just holding on to that money for a rainy day. Ellen at YRChat.com says, am I crazy? Or didn't we actually see Adam putting those stacks of bills in the vent and in the bathroom a long time ago? It was around the time he was planning to take Chelsea and Connor and run away to Europe, right? There was something, they were gonna start a new life, or am I making this up? Ellen, that rings a bell. Does anyone out there remember that? Like it does, doesn't it? Did we see Adam stashing that money? Can anybody confirm that? 
let's get some um let's get some uh sleuths <laughs> there's a yr sleuths out there to tell us uh lisa at yrchat.com says adam or someone pretending to be adam could have contacted chelsea and she's gonna go be with him or thinks she's gonna go be with him. I remember when Chelsea and Adam tried to run away to Paris uh, when Adam escaped from prison. She said on yesterday's episode that she had a backup plan or that she and Adam had a backup plan, uh, but never said what it was. So I think she'll go on a wild goose chase to be with Adam and then learn after some time that it was not him and then return to the soap because she did tweet, bye for now. Um, well, I, I like that you picked up on the fact that she made a reference to having had plans with Adam. That is a clue. And you're picking up on the fact that maybe this is just the cycle. Maybe this could be like an inside job or something to make it look like the actress is leaving. But maybe YNR behind the scenes knows very well they're going to bring her back for some kind of shocking twist reveal that could include Adam. Zuberplex at YRChat.com says, according to the scuttlebutt circulating in the blogosphere, the theory is that Adam is alive and living in Paris, that Chelsea has only recently discovered this fact, which explains the sudden rush in developments. She has decided to follow her heart and abandon everything she's built up until now in order to pursue the love of her life. In order for Chelsea to reunite with Adam and continue to remain beneath the gaze of Victor or Chloe, she's had to establish an untraceable source of income, thus explaining the mirror site she used to funnel cash away from her own company. Presumably, Chelsea and intends to leave Genoa City along with Connor in order to join Adam in Paris just in time for Valentine's Day. Ooh, 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 that is so good. But what about, uh, what about Christian? So did a Adam knows that Christian was his son, right? See, see, that leaves the thing with Christian, too. It seemed like YNR was going to develop around that. I mean, I'd buy the Adam thing. No, I, I buy it. I'm at this point kind of waiting and looking around the corner, peering around the corner for Adam to come back. <laughs> But it is interesting that that the one little sort of hole in that is she just going to leave Christian with Nick if that's the case. I mean, if that's the case, this is all speculation. Consuela had another speculation saying for some reason, I think Chloe and Kevin could be behind the fake Chelsea 2.0 knockoffs. I mean, think about it. Kevin has the same insane tech knowledge and knows that Chelsea and knows Chelsea's designs better than Chloe. And I think Chloe and Kevin are still checked, ticked off with Chelsea about uh, her coming after Chloe. Well, we know that, the, and you probably left this comment, Consuela, before we actually saw Chelsea at the bank and all that, but it is an interesting comment that Kevin and or Chloe could be involved. I mean, they could be involved with her, her as opposed to doing it uh, without her knowledge. Um, you, As you say, Kevin, somebody had to build the website, and it probably wasn't Chelsea, so she could have been involved with Kevin and Chloe right behind. Oh, so last week, um, I asked you guys if you thought that we had seen the end of Ms. Madame Dina Mergeron. Uh, let's see, a st strong 78% of you felt like Dina's gone for now, but she will be back. 22% uh, of you saying that you felt like it was an ending. I, I voted I think she'll be back. I don't know why, but I just I just do. Uh, I thought it was interesting that this week Jack commented to Victor, of all people, that Dina seems to be in a good place right now. Like, she's on the, the, uh, the upswing uh, with her disease. Like, things are going well for her in Paris. So that is, it seems a little bit like that might be a hint, but uh, Mary Ann at YRChat.com voted that no, uh, doesn't think that uh, that Dina will be back. Marianne says it's wishful thinking, uh, and I and that her symptoms were being made worse by Graham since she was improved within her weekly stay in Paris. However, since the uh, producer writer faced the same thing with his mother, I'm not sure he would want to give Dina a false diagnosis or a miracle cure. Yes, I do think that a lot of this probably has been pushed forward by Mal and his personal experience. So I'd say I'd say that's um, that's legitimate. But Marianne also mentions uh, at yrchat.com that Marla Adams has a pre-nomination uh, in the daytime Emmys. It was uh, a pre she has a pre-nom for Outstanding Supporting Actress. I don't know if she'll win that award, but I think she should. I wish she would. I could see her winning. Um, just the combination of who she is and the storyline, I could see her winning. And I would like to see YNR utilize this Emmy Award-winning actress should she should she win and bring her back. 
Ambreen at YRChat.com says, I'm disappointed that Graham was killed. I really wanted to see him date Gloria. That would have been fun. He's a handsome 42-year-old man that would have been great for this show. I like your comment also, Ambreen, because, hey, no reaction from Gloria regarding the death of her sort of boyfriend and friend, Graham. I mean, literally, literally, there is no more mention of Graham. He was alive on Friday, he was dead on Monday, and he was forgotten on Tuesday. <laughs> That, I agree, is disappointing. Diana at YRChat.com says, I think YNR should bring back Graham's mother. That would be totally unexpected. Graham's mother could get revenge on the Abbott family because she blames all of them for her son's death. She has already hated Dina before with a passion. Now she could be hateful toward the whole family. Like, yeah, again, I mean, you'd think somebody might want, re want, want vengeance for, you'd think that, that Graham's mother, does she even know? <laughs> I guess we're not supposed to care. Tony at YRChat.com has a good little uh, uh, twist idea here, saying that maybe Jack and Ashley are working together. Maybe Ashley is out at Jabot getting into Newman, and maybe they'll work together toward taking over Newman. Uh, that's the one thing Jack always wants. I think that would be great, Tony. I kind of don't think so. I think that it, it seems like YNR is more wanting to build up the, the rivalry between Jack and Ashley, but that would be an amazing twist. Lots of mixed reactions about Nikki <laughs> and her behavior this week. Shakona at YRChat.com says, Ooh la la, que caliente. I want to see more of Nikki seducing this young star. Show us how it's done, Nikki. <laughs> And we also have, though, on the flip side, Connor at YRChat.com saying the scenes with Nikki this week made me cringe. Pimping Ashley out to Victor and then having an affair with the contractor. What's the point of being married? Just to show the world that you're a united front? I wanted Nikki and Victor to be the stable couple for the show, but I guess the writers have other ideas in mind. And trust me, I'm open to any new ideas. But this just feels icky to me. Watching her go up the stairs with that guy just made me long for the days where she was the center of Victor's universe. I share that. I do. I do. I share that feeling, Connor, because I, I, you know me. I'm a Nikki and Victor sucker. I've said it a million times. Uh, it was, but it was, but yet at the same time, it's like I, I do kind of like the shock value because it gives me something to talk about on a weekly basis. I was most shocked that Arturo went for it. <laughs> I mean, she, I didn't, I didn't think, I didn't, I got that it was flirty, but I didn't get that it was going to progress to let's go upstairs. I mean, I th it was very bold of Nikki to, to, to take that leap uh, predicting that he was going to react positively to that, su to that suggestion because the flip side of it could have been Nikki getting shut down and feeling really bad. Oh, I, yeah, I mean, he was for it though. Is, but is he, is he for it for the money? Is he going to be a sugar daddy kind of situation? How long is he? on the show is this gonna be an ongoing thing or was this just to give us a little bit of shock ellen at yrchat.com says i never heard any mention of love when nikki moved back to the ranch victor and nikki are basically blackmailing each other into this arrangement nikki says she likes the perks of living as nikki newman and having easier access to the family supposedly they're living separate lives that said, I'm not sure hooking up with a sexy young contractor at the busiest place in town is a wise move. Seems impulsive, but Nikki's a grown woman who can make her own choices. The gossip will be epic. <laughs> that we can count on. Ah, oh, let's talk about Mariah and Tessa here. Daisy on Facebook says, I see a new romance on the horizon with Mariah and Tessa, or perhaps they'll forego a romance and become writing partners. And that makes me wonder if Tessa has been sincere with Mariah or if she's telling Mariah what she wants to hear so Tessa can get what she wants. That's my overarching problem here with Tessa, Daisy. It's like I want to trust her, but I don't at this point. I, I do worry that she's giving lip service just so that she can get what she wants. I You make an interesting point that I hadn't thought of, that maybe they will embark on like a, a duo, like writing partnership or something. Maybe that's why that's being presented to us in that way. Uh, I just don't know. Tessa's got some work to do to rebuild that trust. It is not a given with me. 
Tina Cole at YRChat.com seems to agree, saying, I just cannot get on board with Tessa. I felt bad for her to realize that she's going to be homeless again and sleeping at work, but then the second Noah's done with her, she's going to be at Mariah saying maybe they can be together now? Um, didn't Tessa just tell Mariah that they couldn't be together because be together she wanted Noah? Wasn't she just fighting for Noah, saying she wanted him when he confronted her? So who does she want? And Mariah should not be treated as leftovers because Noah left her. I highly doubt that Tessa would be asking Mariah for them to give the relationship a try if Noah never dumped her. Very, very true, T. Nicole. Oh, boy. I'll, let's, let's, let's flip to Lily and Kane here. Aaron on YouTube says, I love that Lily's willing to give Kane another chance, but I really wish Kane would stop trying to pressure Lily on Sam every five minutes. She's clearly uncomfortable and needs some time to warm up to him. Why can't the baby go sleep in a crib? Is it really necessary for the baby to sleep in the bed with them? Here Kane goes again, overthinking things, thinking he's helping when he's actually making them worse. Yeah, you know what? That's a good point about Kane. Because he, he does try to make things better, Aaron, and then he always ends up making them worse. I hope that's not what's going to happen uh, for, for Kane and Lily. I do still like them together, but isn't it? I just, I don't know why, but I keep wanting to draw parallels between the Lily and Kane story and the Mariah and Tessa story. Mostly because Kane kind of a liar. <laughs> he kind of is. He's a sexy liar. <laughs> uh, I'm not saying I'd put up with them, but I also wouldn't kick him out of bed. Uh, all right, so let's end up here on a, a nice little comment I got from Joanne at YRChat.com saying, Dear Allie, I've been listening to you for a while now, and I just wanted to let you know how much I enjoy your weekly discussion of the previous week's episode. It's like a sixth episode every week. All of the comments from, from your viewers and listeners and your own theories are fascinating. I look forward to having you over for a visit every week. Thanks. Oh, I thought that was a really, really sweet comment, Joanne. I just love hearing from you guys. And I thought this is a comment that kind of goes out to all of the chatters. Like, it is not just me. I'm the one that sits here every week, but I mean, you guys contribute a lot of content. I mean, there's like uh, so many comments every week and it helps me since I can't have you all here with me uh, in front of the camera and the microphone. It, it, it helps uh, to present like different sides so that we're getting kind of a well-rounded discussion of why and are going and not just me and my little narrow view. So thank you so much for, for giving me that comment. I got a really nice comment from Dee this week. It's just, I love hearing from people too that, you know, I love, love hearing from all of the regular chatters, all of the why and our chat famous, uh, the, I mean, you guys, like a lot of you, it's like I mention you every week. So like you're famous among each other. Uh, but I also really like hearing from the people I don't normally hear with that just gives me a little bit of an extra oomph, a little bit of an extra bump to hear from uh, new people and kind of keeps me keeps me going on our chat which I love and I'm so glad to know that you guys love too. Okay, with that said, you know the website, yrchat.com. You know the voicemail, 309-588-4569. You know I love hearing from you, so keep them coming and keep coming back. We'll chat again about our show for our, it's, it's the sixth episode of YNR. Uh, we'll have that next Sunday. So everybody have a wonderful week. I love ya. Bye.